So we are back again with Manas Tarangini after a longish break because uh, he has had uh, time to he has needed time to take care of certain uh, responsibilities, and so have we. So we are back and uh, continuing on the earlier conversation that we had, where we started with the Europe and India. So we look at uh, uh, right now. We will look at two different uh, civilizations and uh, how uh, their unique place in the world. Uh, we have uh, omitted certain other uh, older civilizations like Aztecs with, uh, as well as the earlier now extinct civilizations for obvious reasons. And we've also left out the big uh, chunk of civilization, which is uh, the Islamic civilization because they have uh, you know, uh, been a counter religion without the countervailing effect of a uh, of a uh, recovery or revival of their pre-Islamic uh, traditions. So now going quickly into the question of China, uh, one thing that I have noticed, uh, MT, is that uh, even before Western-influenced uh, strains like Boxer Rebellion, Taiping, or the Dungan Revolt, China seems to have had this cyclical aspect to its history where there are periodic spasms, you know, the An Lushan revolt, the Sunan revolt, yellow turbans, right. red turbans, and so on. And right. uh, this is one act, uh, this is one aspect of internal peasant revolts, what are, you know, very uh, uh, superficially called present peasant revolts and right. external barbarian attacks, uh, what they call, they themselves call the barbarian attacks, such as the attacks by the uh, Mongols or the Zhongnu or other such, uh, you know, Western uh, 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 nomadic civilizations. So, right. uh, you know, how does this, you know, how does this work? Uh, because I've read somewhere about, uh, you said how this actually may work in some ways to strengthen the civilizations and in some other ways uh, to handle certain inconsistencies, civilizational inconsistencies. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think we should uh, break this the response to this into two parts. One is to sort of give a broad historical overview of uh, the legitimacy of empire in China. And then the second is the Chinese political philosophy and how that may have uh, fostered rebellions on one side and on, other, on the other side helped to keep the centrifugal forces at check and allow the development of a unified uh, national identity. So uh, perhaps, you know, except in some uh, connoisseur circles, I think Indians uh, study China much less than they should be. Uh, for one, China is just next door to India, so one ought to be studying them more closely. And second, it's a major adversary for India, at least uh, in the modern context. And it has been to a degree in certain periods in the past. Uh, so this lack of knowledge of China is not a good thing. Uh, barring some great experts like uh, Raghuvira and his son, Lokesh Chandra. And Raghuvira had even warned uh, Jawaharlal Nehru about the dangers of China uh, shortly before their invasion in the 60s and the conquest of Tibet before that. Uh, so, I think uh, if you would see it as appropriate, we'll just give some kind of a historical background to it. Uh, so Chinese have a self-perception that they have a very deep history, uh, very similar to what Indians like to state uh, with or without justification. We hear this uh, blanket term of 5,000 years of Indian history. So Chinese give a similar figure. Now, there's an interesting point. If you see the dynastic lists, uh, they tend to begin their dynastic history around what would be, uh, what in our terminology would be called the Kritika period. So the Kritika period would be when uh, the constellation of uh, Taurus, very specifically the Pleiades or Kritika, which are uh, six or seven st stars in a, uh, visibly for the common observer as a compact cluster when they come at the vernal equinox. So sometime around 2000 uh, to 2200 BCE, uh, 
Uh, that's around when the Chinese uh, dynastic history opens. Now, uh, the Western sinologists, perhaps starting with the influences of uh, Darwin's cousin Galton and subsequently the Chinese boosters like Needham, have tended to accept Chinese history writing and Chinese historical self perception quite uncritically, unlike in the case of India, where they would deny that there was ever anything like an Indian thought process at the time of the Kritika period. But if you look at it from a more objective perspective, uh, the real Chinese uh, historical record begins somewhat later, and it's in the form of these enigmatic uh, etchings or writings on bones, which are known as the Shang bone uh, inscriptions. And this comes from the first. Uh, major recorded historical empire, or empire would be a stretch, historical uh, polity called the Shang polity. And eventually, uh, at this point, the ethnicity was still not self-described as Han. And even today, you see the Chinese referring back to it as something like Huaxia. So uh, the real Chinese identity, even the name China comes much later, roughly contemporaneous with the Mauryan rule in India. Just as the Mauryan unification of the Indian subcontinent happened, uh, there was a very powerful polity which arose in China, uh, which was the Qin Empire and the Shi Huangdi. And uh, Shi Huangdi, through a mixture of clever political maneuvers and the use of hard force and genocide uh, unified a large part of the Chinese people under uh, his rule. And his people were ethnically close to the modern Chinese, which would be called the Han ethnicity, while uh, the empire was not the Han empire, it was the Qin empire coming after the name coming after the clan from which uh, Shi Huang Di. Came, uh, came to power. And it was in that, uh, in the Qin polity that uh, a very important Chinese political thought emerged, which uh, was to shape a lot of uh, the aspects of the Chinese uh, regimes which came thereafter, both their genius and their failings, in my opinion, can be traced back to this thought. And uh, Lord Shang Yang is often uh, credited to be one of the first think thinkers of that school of the Pajia uh, or legalism as it's colloquially referred to in English. Now, uh, just like the white Indologists in India would quibble about whether legal, whether Hinduism existed uh, in the Mauryan period or not, people may quibble. You will see Sinologists quib quibbling about the existence of legalism in the uh, Qin regime, but uh, from the Chinese uh, self-image, we can say that the group of philosophies which were grouped uh, under this bracket of the uh, Chinese legalist thought were pretty uh, unified. And so there is absolutely nothing wrong in using uh, uh, this term legalism for uh, the Pajia, which was uh, initiated by uh, Shang Yang. And subsequently, there was uh, another major thinker. The, the Qin dynasty was uh, succeeded by the Han dynasty, which is where the ethnicity of the modern Chinese uh, get their name or gets its name. And uh, it was at that point that Han Fai, uh, who was a member of, that, uh, of the Han clan itself, uh, he composed a further work on this uh, philosophy of politics. Now, at some level, it's very remarkable that you saw the emergence of this legalist thought uh, around that uh, the, the Qin period and the subsequent Han period, which followed and the transition between those. Because at the same time in India, there was a political synthesis which has some parallels, and that was the Arthashastra composed by uh, Chanakya or Kautilya. Uh, now, now, it's not to say that Arthashastra came into being in India just uh, 
at that time, that is shortly after the invasion of Alexander of Ma Macedon and uh, the creation of the Mauryan Empire, there's a very, as uh, um, Chanakya himself acknowledges, there was a very deep history of uh, political thought, which is uh, traced back to the legendary uh, thinkers uh, with Rigvedic antiquity, like uh, Bharadwaja's father, uh, father Brihaspati and uh, uh, Ushana Kavya, the Bhargava. Uh, so likewise, we must acknowledge, and uh, probably there is some truth when the Chinese thinkers say that their Fajia has a deep antiquity, but it crystallized in a certain form, even as the uh, Arthashastra of Chanakya crystallized at the time of the Mauryan uh, Empire. Likewise, in the Qin and the Han Empire, there was a crystallization of this Fajia thought with the key fears, uh, figures like uh, uh, Lord Shang Yang and uh, Han Fai. And, uh, uh, I would like to make an interjection here to sure, just make sure. an observation. See, sure. two things yes. about the Arthashastra versus the legalist uh, writers, Shang Yang. My, my exposure mm -hmm. is limited to Shang Yang and to Han Faizi. Yeah. The Arthashastra, at all points in time, it, uh, mm -hmm. it keeps as its goal, you know, the welfare of the individual. Somehow, in some way, it keeps the welfare of the individual or welfare of society in terms of uh, safety, in terms of the individual's uh, prosperity. Versus the uh, legalist thinkers always seem to think about social harmony, you know, keeping the place harmonious and uh, safe. And, you know, in somehow, you know, the word that repeats again and again is harmony. Uh, you're again, right. I, you're absolutely right. In a sense, I was, that was going to be the next point. I was going to contrast the two. Uh, that they have one, uh, they have two points of, uh, of similarity. I would say that even Arthashastra is interested in social harmony. And earlier Hindu thinkers, Ushana Kavya or Brihaspati, even in, uh, whose thoughts are expressed in the long deathbed lecture of Bhishma Pitamaha uh, to Yudhishthira, uh, you see uh, the need for the Varna ha harmony. That is, Hindu society exists stably when there's a harmony between the four Varnas. And uh, a lot of attention is paid to that. So harmony is a common point, but there is a dif distinction which I'll come to. And the importance of the monarch. So both of them uh, place great uh, emphasis on having a powerful monarch who is able to field a large standing army which can take care of threats. And... Uh, Perhaps there was a common experience which went into both of these, which would, which would tie into the point with which you initiated this uh, discussion. Uh, India was just coming out of the very traumatic experience of the Macedonian invasion. Uh, and the Brahmanas were particularly hard hit. Uh, Alex from the records of the Yavana side itself, we know that Alexander executed uh, several Brahmanas, especially uh, those of the Katha uh, Shaka, the Yajurvedins of the Katha Shaka who were defending uh, their settlement in what's now the Punjab. Uh, so likewise, we know that uh, the Chin were the first ones who started building this gigantic wall in northern China. And the objective of that was to keep away the invaders from Mongolia. So uh, the in the first invasions from the steppes into the sedentary populations of China and likewise the Macedonian impact on India, I think they produced a similar kind of effect that you needed a mighty uh, samrat, as it would be termed in our uh, language. And uh, in their case, the son of heaven, who would be able to uphold uh, the social harmony or social structure. Now, where the departure comes, uh, it, and it's a very important point, uh, it's, is that in the legalist philosophy, it, it's very simple, nicely expressed by one of their thinkers, that uh, the people are like uh, clay from which a potter makes uh, a pot, or they're like the molten metal from which a smith crafts a metal object. And it's the object of the ruler 
the samrat to uh, model these people and so they have to be uh, molded because otherwise intrinsically these legalist philosophers postulated that people are selfish they are like atomic entities who are only looking for their own selfish uh, needs now one could say that this sort of uh, has some basis in biology that every organism is looking to enhance its own fitness but where the hindu thinkers differed was that they did recognize that second order effect which has a very strong basis in biology that you tend to favor people who are related to you uh, and some larger units beyond that so it is not that people are truly selfish as in selfish to their own individuals but they have loyalties which go uh, a little beyond the individual but the legalist thought saw the people as fungible uh, selfish or atomized individuals who needed to be molded by uh, the great monarch and so at this point yes. i'd like to make another interjection to point sure, out sure. You know, something that struck me you know mm-hmm. even earlier to the arthashastra or to the legalist mm-hmm. thinkers Mm -hmm. the foundation myth or the creation Mm -hmm. myths itself have some you know different uh, takes on it the purusha sukta Mm -hmm. while it looks at the whole society as a body and gives aspects to you know gives different kinds of roles and positions to different kinds of parts of the body the Mm -hmm. chinese creation myth of pan gu the primordial being uh, describes the black hat commoners as yeah. you know numerous as the worms in the stomach of the uh, primordial being so the yeah. chinese attitude towards the commoner is vastly different from uh, you know the indian uh, the traditional hindu attitude towards the commoner or towards uh, people as individuals in general i i think you're right and there's a very interesting point here now that you bring this up that uh, in my own opinion the pangu myth is actually homologous to the purusha myth i don't think it was of chinese origin at all it comes relatively late quite close to this uh, transformation or the unification of china and the chinese uh, it, in true evidence for it comes only around the uh, the chin uh, uh, han trans period and uh, the formulation of it having many variants it seems to have come from an indo european source and i suspect there was a, a homologous version of the purusha origin myth amidst uh, the steppe indo iranians likely uh, an eastern iranic group from whom and we have evidence like from the soma plants uh, transfer to the chinese and the importance of the mahuang which is the name which they use for soma uh, in their own uh, medicine and ritual especially in the early period uh, that there was contact with the indo iranians who were soma uh, pressing and so this pangu myth seems to have uh, been transferred from them but there was a clear interpretation of it in a chinese framework where there was quite a distance uh, between the monarch and as you pointed out this somewhat lesser the black hat uh, lesser mortals uh, the the general populace now in the hindu tradition there is a the monarch while he has the distance and great power he is still supposed to be a fatherly figure after all the people are called praja and uh, there is a relationship between the monarch and them as indra has with the maruts or with prajapati between prajapati and the rest of his progeny so uh, there is a certain organic kinship which is uh, reflected in uh, the praja concept and so when you have uh, the kinship implicit in praja it uh, implies a more super organismic structure to uh, the society of which the aryas uh, conceived uh, whereas the distance is Uh, evident in the pangu uh, origin myth and i think uh, there is some truth to that it came into the, that those conceptions were uh, formalized in a sense in uh, the legalist uh, uh, fagia uh, tradition so uh, one point uh, 
So just to go ahead with this, um, but there are certain further points of divergence. So the place uh, where uh, this, uh, the, so there are two points of divergence which I'll touch upon, which are important for the further discussion. So the way uh, the early legalist thinkers uh, thought that the people could be modeled or the people could be uh, like the clay being shaped into a pot or the smith working as metal. It was through a carrot and stick policy. And uh, this meant a large scale social engineering, which was very different from the Hindu system, which allowed organic social structures to exist. Like even after the Aryan conquest of Northern India, it seems quite clear that uh, the Indus uh, civilization, the Harappan civilization's uh, social structure was not totally disrupted. It uh, was retained as is incorporated now within a new Aryan framework, but the Japis remained as is. I don't think, uh, like when the Yajurveda describes a whole plethora of Japis, like the Rajusarja, the maker of the rope, um, the Manikara, the maker of beads, uh, and the takshaka, the carpenter or the architect making buildings, they were all uh, existing even in the uh, Harappan civilization. The Aryas did not disrupt any of them. They came into the system as is. But what we see in the Chin formulation, the enactment of legalism was a gigantic social re-engineering. And that was to influence China going forward. So the principle here was called the principle of the tiller and the soldier. So there were two uh, kinds of occupations which were greatly privileged. The tiller, which is the farmer, like the Aryas would have called them the Kinasha in India, probably a Harappan word uh, taken into Sanskrit as is. And uh, on the, the Chinese side, the tiller, he was privileged as one of these poles. And the other one was uh, the soldier. So the system of uh, the stick was very obvious. There were harsh punishments. And this harsh punishment of keeping law and order is not uh, surprising because other civilizations, including our own, uh, adopted it. That is Manu and Chanakya, they also recommend for certain kinds of uh, crimes, harsh punishments, uh, so that there's a deterrent role for uh, punishment in society. And definitely, uh, the Stasian civilizations like in Mesopotamia uh, did have such harsh punishment. So that is per se not very uh, different from uh, other civilizations. But the incentive structure or the carrot is very interesting. Now for the soldier uh, in the Chin hierarchy, the way it went was how many heads, how many heads could a soldier chop? So if you chopped 10 heads and brought 10 heads of your enemy, you would get a promotion. And likewise, the tiller was uh, rewarded in terms of how much food he would grow. Now, uh, the such incentive structures exist even in the Indian world, even in the Arya world. Annam bahu kurvita is what uh, the Yajurveda says. The Taittiriya Shruti, uh, the Taittiriya school of the Ayurveda has the statement. So there is a reward for the uh, person who grows uh, more food. But it was very formalized uh, in this legalist system. There was a hierarchy of 20 ranks you could ascend. So if you say brought five heads, you would go the first rank of the soldier. If you maybe grew some two acres of rice, you would go to the first rank of the tiller. And like that, you could keep ascending. So given that there's a 20 rank hierarchy, for most people, there was a lifelong uh, carrot of ascent, which was being offered. And this is a very important point because even modern Chinese society, uh, it, this aspect of ladder climbing is uh, impressed upon them. And they operate in many ways uh, based on this ladder climbing ID. Now, uh, the second thing which went with this uh, social engineering of creating a very uh, ranked, multi-rank hierarchical system uh, was some kind of testing. So if you had to climb up, you had to 
produce something very real so farming or uh, kill it, bringing the heads in for the soldier uh, there were some very real goods so it was not easy to fake and what you can see is that there was a parallel chinese tradition where uh, you had more abstract forms of uh, testing so to say like uh, there were two kinds of poetic traditions you had to learn, master those that poetry and if you passed the exam so to say you were uh, you were given a higher rank but uh, clearly the early legalist thinkers frowned upon these ideas and they also fr- uh, were very explicit in criticizing a council of ministers they said that you should have a strong army in order to fight external threats like say the invaders from the steppes but uh, on the other side you should also fear the danger within the palace of the guy who wants to kill you and become king so there was uh, an absolute monarchist uh, centering which co- taught a distrust of the court and this is uh, the second point of departure whereas uh, chanakya advises the king to have uh, spashas that is spies uh, and dhutas who will uh, bring him information uh, but uh, definitely he doesn't say uh, that you should dispense or, or this distrust for the ministers the ministerial staff is not as extreme um, as you see in the legalist uh, thought and perhaps the centering of power which we see in modern china in the in emperor ji is essentially a reenactment of this legalist thought uh, where he uh, fears even internal comp- competitors within the communist uh, the, the the bureau that uh, he has centered power within himself in a very classic uh, legalist move so uh, mao mao zedong did something similar deng xiaoping did something similar so that uh, that trend of legalism has persisted um through the imperial uh, through the post imperial or pseudo uh, communist uh, system which we have today so i uh, would again like yeah. to you know interject uh, sure sure to just make yeah. another observation that mm-hmm. uh, you know mao said like what was wrong he seemed he, it seemed the tone almost seemed boastful in one of the party congresses where he said if uh, chi huang di you know imprisoned so many scholars we have imprisoned 10 times the scholars if he right. burnt books we have burnt 10 times the books and he seemed yeah. almost very boastful about saying that mm-hmm. uh, and uh, again if you see this uh, the cultural revolution uh yeah. even before we go into the peasant revolts the cultural revolution seems to be something in keeping with chinese tradition with you know where mao said the four olds should be uh, you yeah. know done away with the four old things right mm-hmm. same way mm-hmm. at any step in time you know the chinese have mm-hmm. never you know in terms of mm-hmm. while we always the indian civilization always harkens back to a golden period when and uh, mm-hmm. tries to build on top of what has come earlier the chinese mm-hmm. try to obliterate at some point in time whatever has happened earlier and try to start fresh you know mm-hmm. wipe the slate clean so to speak as an observation uh, true uh, but we have to keep in mind that at the same time there were certain uh, vasanas so to say to use a sanskrit word certain tendencies or uh, an inertia which persisted through these purges and uh, those come from some pretty deep rooted philosophical ideas one of which is legalism uh hello yeah i'm here i just uh, stopped my video okay that's yeah. fine because uh, there was some uh, yeah my screen flashed a bit so i wasn't okay. sure if uh, yeah no worries uh, i'm right here uh, okay okay great uh, yes so this uh, thing which you mentioned of uh, clearing the past that again can be uh, you can see a reflection of that in legalism it's exactly like shi huang di ordering the burning of certain classes of books it's not that he ordered the burning of all books uh, for example books on uh, war or books on agriculture since they fitted the uh, legalist pattern they were totally uh, acceptable 
uh, whereas uh, more frivolous topics as deemed frivolous by him uh, they were uh, burnt now uh, the monitoring of officials or uh, the looking at the the ministerial staff with suspicion one could say that that was a factor which was driving some of uh, the things like say what mao did uh, where you get away with the old because they are seen in a sense as that ministerial staff which is coming in the way uh, of uh, the power in the emperor so uh, this is uh, you know you could uh, call this as uh, uh, call me as essentializing uh, legalism but uh, i do think that its influence has been very strong even down to the current date and when mao calls uh, this comparison to shi wang di and he, he even wrote an essay when he was uh, a youth uh, on the chin empire and shi wang di it was very clear that uh, he was deriving his ins- inspiration from uh, shi wang of the chin and uh, the the philosophy that made that empire Um, now there is one more point about legalism which we should note which is less emphasized now uh, the people when they were being modeled uh, one thing that the legalist philosophers realized was that it was important for them to follow a certain fashion so china in some ways has been a country of fads and this fad is mainly to keep the people occupied with something uh, which is in a sense the soft power carrot so if you're just giving them these 20 ranks to ascend through there could be a certain frustration so you have to take care of their other needs so confucianism could come in as one of those uh, outer courts so there was an inner centering of power uh, in the emperor which was only known to him in a sense or his closest inner circle but what the people would see would not be this uh, the naked fist of uh, legalism but it would be velvet glowed and this velvet outer coating would be something very different looking so in one period it would be confucianism in a later period it would be the bauddha mata uh, then there was a uh, turkism in the tang period and uh, then there was a return to different strains of the bauddha mata thereafter and today you could say that uh, certain western uh, materialist pursuits are uh, given a free reign in china as this outer coating that's the fad which the general population can indulge in uh, so that's uh, let out in the pop- into the general crowd in order to keep them pacified to give them what you may call uh, some kind of meaning to their existence rather than uh, being uh, seeing through that legalist uh, apparatus now so my, at this point yeah. again you know if we mm-hmm. compare and contrast uh, the two people who are jostling or you know struggling for the mm-hmm. mandate of heaven mao mm-hmm. and uh, chiang kai shek uh, one yeah. had the outer coating of communism the mm-hmm. other chiang kai shek seemed to have the outer coating of uh, christianity he actually had himself baptized as a catholic in his 30s if i'm not wrong shankar mm-hmm. shek so mm-hmm. the if you look at it what they were doing it seemed like externally like a fight between communism and the mm-hmm. christian capitalist west whereas in turn it was just two legalist emperor uh, candidates who were fighting for the mandate of heaven absolutely with, uh, their different courts outside uh, absolutely that's uh, that's how Uh, an external student of china should interpret it uh, now if you ask chinese themselves and i have spoken about legalism chinese many of them would deny that it even exists they would say it was a, and those uh, who are aware of it historically they'll say you know it was an old historical theory and it's forgotten that uh, i don't think any of us should be uh, fooled by that there are the subset of politically aware chinese who are willing to be more uh, conversational and uh, i have some 
I have at least one such acquaintance, I have a couple of acquaintances, one of them is Taiwanese. And uh, they would be very, they are much more open with me and they accept right away that yes, legalism is the guiding light, but uh, that's for the ruler, that's uh, for the great man, not for the commoners like us, we go with uh, whatever is there for our aspirations to achieve or what, what wherever they can take us. So it is, uh, there seems to be a very concerted effort to actually shield the population from knowing about legalism. So uh, in a sense, you can compare it with the two predatory Abrahamistic counter religions, where there is a certain deception, self-deception uh, for the larger populace from seeing through uh, its uh, deep inner weaknesses. In the case of legalism, I don't think it would be called a weakness, but uh, it's uh, those who see through it could challenge the system in one or more ways. And that's, that is a good uh, uh, segue, we could say, to come to the issue of these convulsions. So when you treat people as party uh, or metal, Every metal has a certain limit to its malleability and ductility. So you can simply model it like modeling a metal that at some point uh, the ductile strength of the metal uh, is uh, reached and it snaps. So uh, the, the strain on the metal exceeds its capacity to take it. So likewise, one of the driving forces is, uh, are these, uh, is the heavy hand of the rule, which could cause uh, a snapping to take place. That's one kind of uh, thing which could lead to a convulsion. The second kind of convulsion is uh, when you center power in the monarch, and the monarch is quite separate from uh, the rest. That is, there's a true huge gulf, uh, unlike in, say, the Hindu system. As long as he is the Rajan, he is endowed with Indra and Yama and Varuna and so on. But there are many who are like him. He's still just one of the Rajanya, uh, the, the Kshatriya community. And he also has a certain challenger in the form of uh, a different kind of power, which is the Brahma power from his uh, courtiers who may be Brahmanas. And in terms of pure economic power, he could be challenged by the Vaishyas, who in, in many cases had much more wealth than a Rajanya. Uh, so uh, that kind of separation was not uh, obvious in the, the Chinese system. Uh, and there was, it was a unified system that is when there were big empires, the Han ethnicity uh, was like a steamroller which cleared other ethnicities in part through genocide, in part through mating. Uh, so in, you had a large canvas to play where there were big stakes. So if there are big stakes, obviously there are going to be other people who are going to contend for it. So that uh, would mean that there would be a, uh, a contention for the position of the emperor, and that led to the second class of, uh, of convulsions. And uh, finally, one uh, this is quite speculative. Actually, I should make two points. First, the speculative one, that perhaps this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, imperial rule, especially with the legalist uh, imposition, if the outer court is not uh, for some reason, the outer court peels off, then people have a certain insufficiency. And uh, one period when this was experienced was uh, in the late Qing Empire, which was the last uh, of, of the official imperial powers. Uh, while it was not a Chinese power, it was a Sinicized power, and it was ultimately ruling uh, under Chinese principles, you could say. So, uh, it, in its last days, there was this extreme uh, dissatisfaction uh, because the outer core court had completely peeled off and there were various kinds of uh, external 
attractions which people were finding appealing to them, uh, which people found appealing to them. So um, that sparked a second uh, body of uh, rebellion, so to say, which went hand in hand with the, the more conventional peasant kind of rebellion. Uh, finally, we have to acknowledge one fact and you don't hear this uh, from the more official Chinese uh, history accounts. And also many Indians seem to ignore this fact that for more than half of its history, China was ruled by non-Han rulers. Essentially, China was conquered and ruled by external conquerors for more than half of its his recorded history. That's a very important fact to keep in mind. Now, what it meant was that there was a Han population, a gigantic Han population, which from time to time, when it was conquered by these external powers, uh, uh, occupied a subordinate position to differing degrees. And if it occupied a very subordinate position, there was an obvious nationalist sentiment uh, which arose in them. So there were two periods when this nationalist sentiment was intensified. One was under the Chinggisid Mongol conquest. So uh, the Mongols, after completing the conquest of a divided China, at the, on the eve of the Mongol invasion, China was trifurcated into three powers. There was the Southern Song, who were of Han ethnicity, and they are what you would call the Chinese proper. In the north, and the Northeast, there were two distinct powers. From a Manchurian center, uh, the Yurchen uh, invaded and founded a steppe based, a semi steppe based empire. That is, they were a mixture of agricultural and steppe economy. And that was known as the Jin Empire. And uh, these people had, uh, they were of Tungusic, they were a Tungusic uh, language speaking group. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it forms a language continuum uh, with Mongolian and Turkic. There is no clear consensus as to whether Turkic, Mongolic, and Tungusic ever had a common origin. But uh, due to proximity, they have exchanged a lot of uh, uh, linguistic structure and words. So the, the, the Jurchen, they founded the Jin in the Northeast. In fact, and even... Then, uh... Even from physiognomy, you can see that mm. you know these people look different. They that's, are much that's bigger correct. than the average Han Chinese. Have very different yes. features uh, than the average uh, Han Chinese. Yeah, if you observe closely, yes, you can make out people of uh, of the successors of the Yurchen are the Manchu. Yeah. Uh, so you can still make them out even today. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. And then in the northwest, more towards the Indian border, you had uh, the Tibetan, Tibeto-Mongolian group known as the Tangut or the Chichia Empire. So this trifurcated China was the one which uh, faced the great attack of Chinggis Khan and his successors. So Chinggis Khan, during his lifetime, he conquered the Chichia and on his, close to his death, he launched uh, his mobile forces to attack the, the Jin and to defeat them. And subsequently, his son, Ogodai, and uh, successors like Guyuk, Monk, Kublai, they uh, conquered the Jin and the Song uh, one after the other. So the whole of the Chinese sphere came under the Mongol Empire. And uh, the Mongols in China, the, chi the Chinese term for them was the Yuan Empire. So, uh, and Clearly, the Han became a second-class citizen at that point. Uh, they had lots of uh, opportunities. For example, Kublai Khan shipped, men, not shipped, but sent many of them to Central Asia to set up farming in the steppes because he saw agricultural production as a good tax base. Uh, and uh, he employed a lot of them as his uh, soldiers and advisors too. But uh, definitely, there was a a distance that is they were uh, they could not by any means occupy the positions which the mongols occupied 
So eventually this uh, resentment under the Mongolian yoke led to uh, a great convulsion, which was uh, in some ways analogous to a peasant revolt because it was the masses which came together under the new leaders who then founded the Ming Empire after the overthrow of the Mongol uh, rule in China. And this overthrow was a protracted period. They were first able to evict them from Beijing after a nationalist uh, rebellion. But in Yunnan, where Vajravarmi, uh, Bauda Mongol, was well established and he had an alliance with Japan, uh, they, he was able to hold, down, hold, hold out for a while and it took a long struggle for the Ming to uh, eventually crush the Mongol uh, resistance in the south. Uh, still, there are Mongol speakers uh, to this date uh, in some of those places left behind. So this was yet another convulsive force that is uh, the second class citizen status which the Han acquired whenever they were conquered by a major power. The second time this happened was under the Manchu, when uh, the Manchu, uh, so the Jurchen, who are the first uh, founders of the Jin Empire, they were conquered by Chingi, the Chinggisid Mongols and they faded away into the steppes. But after the Chinggisid Mongols started declining in Mongolia, especially in the Inner Mongolian region. Uh, the Jurchen came back, and by this time, they had deep marriage connections with the clan of Chinggis Khan and his brother, Kasar. And so th they had a common front. They had an allied front of the Chinggis and Manchu combined. And under the new Khans of, uh, the, of this new Jurchen power, and they called themselves Manchu after the Bauda deity uh, Manju, uh, Manju Gosha or Manju Shri. So the founder, he had uh, a, a vision that he, he himself was a Bodhisattva or he was a reincarnation of Manju Shri. Uh, and he held the sword of Manju Shri, which was uh, in some ways analogized to the sword of Kalkin. So he saw himself as a divine ruler in a sense. Uh, so that's how they got their name of Manchu. So this new power, it conquered the Han, um, it destroyed the Ming Empire and it uh, conquered the Hans. And they were reduced to pretty groveling uh, situation, to a groveling status. Uh, there was a dress code, they could not adopt the same dress as the uh, as the Manchu rulers, and uh, they had to, uh, there was an apartheid to a degree. They couldn't uh, occupy some major posts. So, uh, uh, under this, it was natural that as the Manchu power started declining, there was going to be a nationalist uh, revolt. And this was accentuated as the European powers started uh, attacking China and uh, the Manchu power was being reduced. And subsequently, the Japanese took their chance and inflicted a major defeat uh, on, the, on the, the Qing. So and in this backdrop and the humiliating defeats of the opium wars uh, closer to our times, as you well know, uh, a series of convulsions, which should be seen as a combination of the nationalist sentiment against the Manchu, as well as uh, the dis dissatisfaction as the outer core, court of legalism bore out. And uh, there was an interest in new ideas like uh, the, the Taiping Rebellion, the Nian Rebellion. Uh, these were in flux. Taiping, could, you could see the, the Chinese brother of Jesus Christ it was clearly a Chinese understanding of Christianity, which uh, prefigured or which lay at the uh, base of that rebellion. And the excess of males was another problem. Uh, the sex ratio being skewed and a lot of males uh, without uh, mates is always a recipe for war. And uh, that could have been one of the factors behind the Nian rebellion. So the coming together of uh, all these factors, nationalism, 
uh, extrinsic ideas like uh, Christianity, uh, the sex ratio skewing, and uh, taxation and peasant uh, discontent meant that the end of the Qing was a, a particularly convulsive phase. And here is where uh, Islam in China comes in. So when you see the wobble, uh, a counter-religion takes its chance, and Islam is particularly effective in taking its chance when there are such uh, wobbles in the state. So uh, we had the Hui rebellions of the Hui, who are the Chinese Muslims. So uh, you uh, have a particularly violent period in the 1800s, from yeah, the so, mid-1800s onwards. Yeah, so at this point, yeah. you know, we kind of do a transition in our discussion where mm -hmm. we are discussing the intrinsic, you know, uh, power changes, power shifts, and the peasant rebellions brought upon due to the uh, external coating, which uh, legalism was employing to disguise itself or to uh, give something an alternative to the commoners uh, hmm. when it starts fraying versus uh, a totally different uh, phenomenon. So the first hmm. one, it seems to be well attested in Chinese uh, thought and also it seems to be, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, thinkers are quite matter of fact about it. Uh, mm -hmm. In a sense that they say, the, you know, this uh, saying is that the state long, the empire long divided shall unite. The empire mm -hmm. long united shall divide. So they mm -hmm. are quite, you know, uh, complacent or, you know, in a sense, they expect uh, this kind of uh, cyclical aspect to their history and to power yes. shifts. So but, uh, fusion is yeah. indeed very intrinsic to their thought. As I said, the historically aware uh, Han Chinese whom I have had lengthy conversations with, they enjoy bringing up this point and they accept the fact. They say someday this empire, which we have a communist empire, will dissolve, it will break up, but then we'll come back again. That's how our history is. So it's pretty ingrained in their thinking of fission, the fission-fusion cycle. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you take, have this on one hand, and then when you come to the their, uh, their confrontations with the Abrahamic religions, there it becomes a totally different phenomenon altogether. They seem to somehow, you know, try to absorb. It's The pattern is that they try to absorb it somehow, are unable to digest the way they digested the Xiongnu, they digested the Jurchen or the Manchu, they are unable to digest these, and then it results in some really cataclysmic events, like the Hui Revolt or the Taiping Rebellion or the uh, Dungan Rebellion. So, what do you think about uh, these, you know, these uh, uh, encounters with uh, Abrahamic religions? Uh, before I step to that, I, I think we should go a little further back in time, which may give us some uh, background. Uh, so one issue we should note is that uh, unlike India, both India and China have experienced a very long uh, period of foreign rule uh, in which the Indians and the Chinese were reduced to a second class status under the foreign rule. But uh, the important point was that all the foreign rulers of China were uh, heathens. None of them were uh, Abrahamists, especially the predatory Abrahamists, the two predatory Abrahamists. And that made a very big difference. Uh, in reality, it infused them with a warlike uh, spirit coming from outside. Uh, the earliest Indo-Iranian invasions into China brought them the horsebone chariot, which was a military technology. Subsequently, uh, the Iran, Eastern Iranic and Hunic invasions, the first Hun Kaganate of the Xiongnu, uh, brought them mounted archery, the stirrup, and the like. Uh, so these invasions, while they conquered the Han people, they also contributed to them certain military technologies from Eurasia. Uh, and the second thing was these. Inva these invaders, they, due to their mobility, uh, 
the horsebone mobility, which finally came to an end uh, only due to the uh, modern um, artillery, uh, allowed them to conquer larger territories. For example, the great expansion of the Tang eastwards and the conquest of the Indic oasis civilizations like the uh, cities of Agni and Kucha uh, and Khotan and the like were carried out by a Turkic elite to whom the Tang Empire uh, emperors were married. So the Taizong was particularly close and uh, had marital relationships, the great emperor Taizong of the Tang uh, with these Turks. And the, the spearhead of his uh, eastward, oh, sorry, of his westward thrust and major attacks were these Turkic uh, cavalrymen uh, of the Ashina clan. Uh, so the, the invaders, to a large part, benefited uh, the Chinese people. Now, in the earlier phase, uh, and I know that many Indians are going to hate me for saying this, and I, I have already experienced it on media like Twitter. I think even we benefited from some of the same invaders. I would say that the Kushana uh, provided a very good in interim phase of unification, even though it was a foreign rule, and eventually even we had an upsurge of nationalist sentiment and uh, overthrew the Kushanas under the Guptas. Uh, but the Kushana reign was not a bad one uh, for the Hindus. And uh, it uh, established our uh, links to Central Asia. It reaffirmed, one would say more precisely, and kept the trade going. The economy was uh, kept alive and so on. So the, there, are, there is a huge qualitative difference. Even if, you're, if you suffer a certain reduction in status uh, between heathen invaders and Abrahamistic invaders. Now, the big difference between China and India is that China was not conquered by an Abrahamistic power uh, in total. Uh, Timur, the Mongolic, the Islamized Mongolic conqueror, he, on his last uh, campaign, he was headed out for a jihad on China. Had he succeeded in that? history would have been very different, I keep saying. But uh, he met his 72 Hauris uh, by his own account. As he said, he heard them calling out to him uh, on his way to uh, China. So uh, Chinese were saved in a big way from, uh, because it's quite likely that the Ming would have been smashed by uh, Taimur and Islam would have been imposed on at least a part of China. Now, uh, the other thing which we have to note is that the legalism is very conscious about threats to the emperor, which can come from a religious domain. And we saw this even before the counter-religions on two occasions. The first was with the Manikists, who are an Iranian religion, uh, dualistic religion. And uh, the Kaganate, the early Kaganate of the Uyghurs, they adopted uh, Manikism. And when the Uyghur the conquest of China, northern China happened uh, at the height of the Uyghur Empire, uh, they were Manikists and they brought in Manikism into China. And there was a very strong reaction in which it, they wiped out uh, the Manikists or at least in part, uh, utilized them. Now, in the Tang period, uh, when an epidemic, perhaps smallpox, maybe some other viral epidemic, swept through China, again, the sentiment resurfaced, and the Bauda, there was a strong anti bauda reaction. And many Indian uh, teachers who were in China and their Korean students uh, were all kicked out uh, because Bauda was seen as a threat. Uh, so then, in the event of some external stress, they can very quickly react to uh, external religions, which are perceived as getting beyond that outer core and influencing the inner circle. Now, at some points, they did reach the inner circle, and perhaps that's why this threat became very perceptible to them. And one such uh, was the Bauda uh, system. Uh, 
so the Tang emperors, uh, after the after it came, the the Baudas were allowed back in. Uh, many of them had uh, a Jaya Bisheka, which was done uh, by the Bauda uh, Tantrikas, and it was done in a very uh, typical Indian fashion with the invocation of Kubera and Nalakubara for the victory of the uh, Tang army. Now, uh, Islam came early and the Chinese uh, saw it as uh, just a coastal religion to large part since it was uh, pervaded by Arab traders. And uh, there was one major rebellion which took place relatively early. I'm not remembering the precise dates, but it was a pre-Mongolian rebellion where uh, the Chinese perceived the missionary activities taking place in a coastal uh, city of uh, the Islamic Dais, and they wiped them out. It was essentially a genocide, as the West would like to call it. Uh, so they are not shy of using mass killings when they perceive that threat. So uh, we should remember that they had a certain immune reaction to Islam very early on when they perceived that uh, the conversion activities infringing on their territory. And you can contrast this with, say, the activities which are taking place in Gujarat by a very similar uh, contingent of Arab traders where the local Hindu monarchs were encouraging them, letting them build mosques, uh, have a free hand in, in the uh, in our Hindu style of living and uh, letting live. But uh, that's not necessarily there with the Chinas. Now, the, the stronger imposition or a, a, a more uh, intense taste of Islam came when uh, the Mongol rule, the, the Yuan dynasty was uh, lording over China. And uh, the Mongols had a very secular mindset, uh, to use the word secular in the Indian uh, uh, sense of the usage, the very peculiarly Indian sense of the usage. That is, uh, uh, different members of the Mongol royalty, they experimented with various religions, the, uh, uh, the wife, the queen, the Korean queen of one of the Mongol uh, princes, uh, she was a, a devout Bauda, and in the same court there would be mullahs preaching uh, Islam to the Mongolian prince who began, uh, Ananda was his name, he began as a devout Bauda and converted to Islam and became a fanatic uh, Mohammedan and encouraged uh, a large contingency of uh, Mohammedans to settle and uh, operate within his uh, Ulus in China. So this was when uh, a second major uh, impact of Islamic presence was seen by the Chinese. Now, uh, the real damage, so to say, you could, uh, there were other periods, like even during the uh, Ming period, there were uh, Islamic activities or, or of the Hui in China. For example, the famous admiral, the Chinese admiral Zheng He, uh, it's believed that he was a Muslim who got castrated. Uh, he was one of the Muslim rebels who in his teens was captured by uh, the Chinese forces and they chopped off his genitals. And now uh, in this, in, he, thus he became a eunuch and uh, he was uh, now made the, he eventually rose the ranks as the admiral. So the presence was there, but the important difference with respect to India was they were not conquerors. The, the Han or the conquering force like the uh, Qing, that's the Manchu Qing, they held the upper hand. But uh, the tendency of a counter-religion like Islam or Christianity is uh, it doesn't accept uh, other religions. Uh, they don't accept other religions. So a clash is inevitable. And uh, such clashes happened when the imperial power weakened in the last days of the Qing. And because the imperial power was uh, much weaker then, it took a lot of effort uh, for the Qing to suppress these revolts. 
but what we must note is that the jihadi activity was in every sense more intense was in every, sorry every sense intense as one would have experienced in say india uh, it had many of the same features communal rights as they call them in india uh, similar rights took place uh, in the late qing china and uh, these uh, islamic rioters and terrorists would go out into the countryside killing people uh, but the han in this case were completely aligned with the qing overlords and they exhibited a very strong immune reaction so to say uh, to the islamic forces so there was a people level uh, antipathy uh, towards them and uh, that result uh, and the counter reaction which resulted in these uh, jihads pante dungan and the like being uh, suppressed with an iron hand and uh, in large part i would attribute this to three factors one that long sense of uh, otherness of these external religions including bauddha which they had which the populace had to some degree and uh, this was reflected in the form of say the civil service exams it's not that you had islamic thought or bauddha thought as part of the civil service exams what you had were classic chinese poetry class really han based uh, that is truly han thought was what went into it uh, so the civil service was not easily corrupted by external influences even if in their personal lives they were bauddhas they had some tantrika rites done for their own success and so on the second is uh, at least in the case of the qing convul islamic convulsions there was an alignment between the han and the qing both of them saw uh, the islamic rioters and uh, rebels as a threat as a serious threat to them and uh, the third issue Uh, which perhaps is where uh, there's a, it's more controversial is i think uh, the han did not see them as part of their own ethnicity even if they were chinese speaking even if they, it was not a modern concept of ethnicity they were seen as the other now in many cases in india this was not the case whole castes would undergo partial conversion so you may have a metal worker or smiths some of whom would be muslim some of whom would be uh, hindu they would be speaking the same language uh, so other than religion there was still an inter uh, interaction between them and they didn't see them as different but the hui were clearly seen as distinct or the mongols who had converted to islam there it was even more accentuated ethnicity difference and religion difference so i think these factors allowed china to resist uh, the islamic uh, rebellions which them despite not being rulers uh, were of quite a, a great magnitude that is uh, they could have resulted in the establishment of uh, local uh, islamic states hmm. so uh, this is something which uh, we should uh, keep in mind and the, the chinese generals who led the campaigns against uh, the islamic rebels uh, they were uh, very systematic they didn't stop with short victories or uh, they went to, they went on until the campaign Uh, was taken to the point of completion where there was no opportunity for uh, the islamic powers to fight back so, so perhaps, i'd like to just yeah, interject yeah. again here to yeah. tell our yeah, viewers sure. what was the scale of the uh, what was the scale of the thing that happened i believe mm-hmm. it was that uh, general who was called the dog meat eating general uh, mm. i believe there was one general who was called the dog meat eating general and then at a later point in time there was this uh, general so against uh, in whose name you have a famous american dish i believe called general so's chicken 
yes and, yes uh, i was thinking of him when i yeah. spoke of the systematic campaigns yeah so yeah. to give our listeners or viewers a idea of the scale of what they did the southern part of xinjiang was completely emptied of human beings and uh, yeah. people from elsewhere were resettled so the uyghurs in the southern part of xinjiang were actually resettled after completely uh, you know eliminating the almost completely eliminating the human population of that region which is in literally hundreds of thousands or probably even millions of people so yes those are the kind of really extreme measures that the chinese state was willing to take and in my in certain terms they are still willing to take these kind of extreme measures uh, yes. to get what they want like say if we look at the dungan hui rebellion uh, it was uh, the chinese took a lot of losses there are many estimates which you can find in different sources but at least 10 million people minimum probably close to 30 million people died in it this is not saying that uh, this is not a number of a genocide but that was the total death uh, from the dungan hui rebellion uh, so it was the islamic jihad slaughtering a lot of han and uh, manchus too but when the fight back took place it was a total wipe out uh, so whole provinces were indeed largely emptied of hu of the hui uh so it uh, that's how essentially islam was quelled in china many uh, people today would not like to hear that especially in the west uh, both sinophilic uh, people and pakistanis who are of course great admirers of their brothers from the east uh, they <laughs> would be shocked to hear <laughs> uh, the way islam was put down in yeah. china and possibly if there is any you know if there is some part of uh, pakistani territory that they may covet that they may want uh, mm-hmm. i don't know whether I, i mean of course given there are much more constraints international constraints in this day and age but i don't know what uh, to what extent the even the current communist government in china would be willing to go to claim certain territory that they may want oh they would uh, do it without hesitation i, I think uh, see we The, for example i heard that the american president re- made some remark like we should be prepared to make a strong statement about the suppression of the uyghurs in china so it is like a kadi ninda karenge hum kadi ninda karenge uh, so <laughs> they can only do kadi ninda the, uh, the chinese will go about with their business whether you do kadi ninda or not uh, mm-hmm. so uh, i think at this moment the west is not uh, in a position to uh, to really uh, impose its will in any way on uh, the chinese who uh, who may be carrying out some kind of suppression uh, it's not clear you know i think there is also a certain exaggeration that the uyghur are being uh, killed uh, they have become more sophisticated so to say now they are treating it in a very different way it's a reeducation camp just like they reeducated a large part of the han population uh, after the tiananmen square rebellion people were sent to the reeducation camps um, so it's a similar kind of uh, yeah probably you happened. know a large uh, large scale indoctrination while some yes. of these things that you stories that come out are shocking really uh, that yes. you know they make these uh, imams dance they make yes. people eat pork you know they make people drink liquor and uh, they ban beards and they ban fasting during ramzan all of this sounds really you know uh, unimaginable especially to a indian uh, these are unimaginable right. things which you could do to people uh in terms of yeah uh, but uh, but they are very mild in comparison to general show or yeah. uh, the suppression of the dungan hui uh, rebellion let's uh, let's face it that's yes. uh, uh, the, the han and the qing have gone through much more in the past and the current chinese government uh, 
is is capable it's not to say that they won't do it if they need to do it but, but uh, you yeah. know from a utilitarian perspective you know if you can re educate them and make them work in your factories why would you want to kill them that's probably how the czech communist government will look at it right that's indeed a part of the calculus also the women that is there is a shortage of uh, females mm. in china so uh, the other way is by by taking the women to both in tibet as well as in uh, the in uiguria that is a common mechanism that is the han are sent there and soon you'll have a generation of uh, half han uh, people and then uh, the, the islam can be diluted and eventually uh, rolled back yes yes so uh, yeah so objectively speaking uh, the, one has to say that uh, the modern chinese government's uh, approach cannot be compared to the degree to which uh, the old emperors bent to uh, suppress different kinds of rebellions yeah because the tools and techniques are more sophisticated now you can uh, you know you can give them the uh, you can basically seduce them by uh, materialism shopping malls you know shopping entertainment rock concerts yeah. sports all of these things you know can easily tone down uh, extremist yeah. tendencies and then you can slowly get rid of them by uh, yeah so but then the, there is this shock therapy which they give to probably purge uh, the large population the vast population will probably if they are freed from the if they are removed if the regular practices like you know the food uh, or drink dietary restrictions and the uh, the the strong sense of community which uh, things like daily friday prayers and you know the ramzan fasting create if you can get yeah. rid of those then uh, what will come after that will probably be materialism uh, music uh, videos and uh, you know movies <laughs> and shopping all those things which uh, you know many almost any uh, government uh, including in the west and in india any government and any ruling system uses to keep the masses under control right right so yeah it, it's uh, so the intent may be similar but uh, the methods used were far more brutal is all that i would uh, point out at this point and the same applies to the so called uh, chinese christianity that is uh, uh, hong ji jiu chuan's uh, rebellion that's the chinese brother of jesus christ uh, so his chinese uh, christianity he wanted to establish as a, uh, essentially a legal state where the outer court uh, might have been this uh, christianity or the west won't the west is always uh, uneasy about calling it christianity because it's not jesus but he is the brother of jesus so he is the second jesus who has come in the midst he is the younger brother of jesus who has come in the midst of the chinas now uh, in order to suppress that the, the qing went through a great deal of uh, uh, effort especially given that uh, he adopted some of the similar some of the same traits or some of the same devices which we saw earlier with uh, christianity christianity often use subterfuge uh, there is an old syriac christian document which says that when amidst the worshipers of brahma you have to present uh, jesus as brahma when amidst the worshipers of zeus you have to present him as zeus so likewise uh, in the case of the typing rebellion's leader hong he was presenting it as a version of uh, christianity which was compatible with the chinese it was the heavenly father shang di who uh, who is his uh, god and that christ or the christian god is no different from shang di 
So that same aspect of subterfuge was used to uh, gain a large number of converts and followers. Uh, but to the credit of the Qing, they saw the great danger from this uh, religious uh, subversion. And uh, his rebellion had an ethnic aspect to it because it was particularly uh, directed at the Manchus in the cities where Manchus lived. And uh, there was a massacre of several Manchus, of thousands of Manchus in places where, which he took uh, hold of. So uh, obviously the Qing had a good reason to retaliate uh, in a pretty brutal way. And uh, it was eventually crushed, uh, again, at the end costing several millions of lives. Uh, so the scale of the deaths uh, which you see in these convulsions is extraordinary. Uh, it, uh, the, especially the compression or, or the temporal compression, it happens in a small window uh, during which you see these millions of people uh, die. So uh, that I think is again uh, quite unprecedented elsewhere in the world. So you could the, say the Christian conquest of Goa and the killings of the Hindus there, it happened over a fairly protracted period. Now, the Islamic yes. conquest of India, definitely it was one of the bloodiest events and uh, millions were killed. There is no doubt about it. Uh, but the nature of those killings are again protracted. Yes, uh, uh, with sporadic bursts of violence and then long periods of, you know, uh, some kind of stasis. And the rollback which happened in India of any kind of Christian conquest was relatively, you know, I think uh, nowhere in the world have, uh, you know, Islamic or, uh, you know, any Abrahamic religions been rolled back with, to whatever limited success we have had in rolling them back with so little bloodshed or actual violence. Even if you take the campaigns of Vijayanagar or Shivaji Raja, Chhatrapati Shivaji, they were far less, there was far less violence in terms of how much, in, uh, you know, uh, damage was inflicted on the general population and on the general, the average Muslim on the street. Or for that matter, in the, during our freedom struggle, there was far less violence inflicted on the average Christian or the average Britisher, conquering Britisher, uh, than probably anywhere in the world. Yeah, it was definitely on the lower side. But I think we also underestimate our rulers' capacity for putting down these counter-religions. Uh, I see it as a common trait amidst the Hindu, uh, the, uh, the Hindu Paksha to say, oh, we didn't know anything. We didn't know total warfare. We were such wimps. Uh, our guys are constantly complaining as though we did nothing. Uh, for whatever we glimpses we can get and one thing i have to admit is that we keep uh, poorer records than the chinas do the chinas definitely document uh, things better than us but whatever we can see i think vijayanagara did wage some pretty bloody wars uh, where there was a total wipeout of the islamic population in certain places uh, if not the whole of their conquered territory, certain places, we can say that there was a wipeout. And the Islamic sources themselves grudgingly accept this. And the Vijayanagaran kings would make demands like, you all have to convert to Hinduism yeah. and so on. They didn't succeed in, uh, in doing that, but I won't put it beyond them that had Talikota gone the other way, they might have suppressed at least some of, uh, the, I don't see them as, uh, the dynamics don't suggest a large scale garvapasi, but there could have been a degree of garvapasi. And what you we know, do know. You know, uh, love, in probably, you know, in the symbolic fashion and in, uh, you know, some critical people, you know, for example, uh, if you had uh, done a garvapsi of some key prominent figures in the sultanates, the Bijapur or yes. the Bamani right, sultanates, right. 
then the yes. common populace anyway for a very long period was freely moving between islamic and hindu practices like the mevs of mewat or even you know in the south in ramnathapuram there was hardly any there was it was a pretty fluid identity i would say hmm. Hmm. yeah yeah so the, yeah, yes you're right if the top figures were gharva apasi was done then uh, things could have followed uh, that is the rest would have just fallen in place and it's interesting that the vijayanagaran rulers had such objectives where they uh, they were uh, that it looked as though that was the ideal when uh, he turushka suratarna acharya when he calls himself that he's and he says that turushka surat suratrana sorry should be having diksha under his foot Ali Ram Rai's message. Yeah, this was, was, uh, I recently this read was, it, and uh, it was actually it was a bit funny also the way he, uh, you know. Uh, Ram Rai, I think he went even one step ahead. <laughs> he said that I will convert you to becoming a worshipper of the linga of Virupaksha or some such <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, he he said that you will be falling at the feet of Shiva. Yeah. <laughs> so and krishna deva raya saying that he'll be giving diksha to adil shah who has been <laughs> brought to his foot <laughs> so i think the and bukka deva raya from their own accounts after he took one of the forts he just wiped out uh, all the turushkas that they say and uh, gopanarya after the conquest of sri rangam uh, the appraised bows urdva dhanushkan turushkan he uh, he destroyed all of them so uh, he cut down all of them so i think uh, there is a certain underplaying on our side of what our uh, leaders achieved and uh, that they were uh, capable of conducting total war and it was not uh, that you know they would uh, after conquest they would uh, just let everyone go uh, yeah it would be probably but, if you it would be some symbolic humiliations some sporadic incidents of extreme violence and uh, a few symbolic humiliations uh, so to speak uh, so that I, you know the uh, opposing party is brought in line one thing we should realize in purely military terms it's very difficult to kill a large number of people yes so uh, that's a uh, that's the bottom line to go and kill one by one it's not uh, at all a militarily uh, safe strategy in yes. most occasions because the other guy is not going to be waiting to uh, for you to come and collect his head so uh, uh, these events of massacres had to be calibrated depending on the objectives and w- where they s- seek to get Uh, what what was the end result they desired and i would say that we are giving too little credit to the hindu fight back especially in the modern hindu pakshas whining when we yeah. say that, when they keep saying that we were incapable of fighting a war of the order the china spot yes uh, our uh, actions were very different from what uh, the way the taiping or dungan rebellions were put down that's a, a totally different ball game but we cannot say that the hindu rulers were total wimps completely unaware of uh, the situation either see like they say any problem in the world can be uh, solved with the uh, sufficient uh, uh, and uh, you know appropriate use of dynamite explosive so you know violence is also you know in state craft it's also there is a optimal point and the appropriate use of violence and uh, the hindu kings probably always you know balanced uh, the return on investment on how much violence they could inflict on an enemy uh, is my reading of it because even when hamir dev uh, or uh, or bappa rawal were supposed to have rolled back the islamic invasions yeah. they still you know there was there must have been definitely it was it wouldn't have been uh, you know without a lot of violence but then the proportionate oh, absolutely 
yeah the proportionate like results that. are quite uh, you know uh, you know the results are quite disproportionate to the amount of violence used so uh, you right, get excellent right. so, results for minimal violence uh, right and i think that's uh, yeah i i don't disagree with that and i think we should not totally discount statements when uh, uh, i don't remember which rana but one of their inscriptions says that he slew numberless turushkas i think it was uh, viraham mira uh, there is something to that statement of he slew numberless turushkas or when uh, maharana kumba is also said to cut down all the turushkas at nagaur uh, i don't <laughs> it's it doesn't sound good to the modern ear the modern hindu ear but i yeah i think uh, these were not empty statements these inscriptional statements were not at all empty is my uh, interpretation of them yeah 